Uh, then one thing that they don't teach us in school, but one thing that I feel that is very important, uh, because most of the time when it comes to communications, we talk about empowering, how you motivate people. But one thing that uh, that is actually very hard and you will need it in your life is to deliver bad news. And as a leader or as a manager or when you manage a team in life, uh, you will need some skills to deliver bad news because it's not a very pleasant thing. Uh, another thing that I will cover is managing underperforming employees. So how do you communicate with members of your team that you feel are not giving 100%? And then finally, a topic that is the hardest, and especially if you're an emotional leader, uh, and Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, good. Sorry guys for this communications problems. We're covering communications and we're having communications problems. So this is how, um, you know, the show must go on no matter what. So, as I said, communicating clearly on all channels. Sometimes we have meetings, we go over things, and that's where we finish. What I really is very important is, yes, when you go, when you present ideas, when you have meetings, you go through, uh, you know, the verbal promises and the verbal presentation. But after each meeting, just make sure that you send an email to everyone that you've discussed with and just go all over the things that were discussed in the meeting. Believe me, 90% of the people forget about uh, the things that have been mentioned in meetings because sometimes meetings can be very boring. So what is really important, once you have a meeting, uh, just send an email to everyone and just send a summary. Okay, guys, this is what we discussed. These are, you know, the things that we need to cover. Now, be consistent in communications. And this is very important when you're managing a team, when you're managing a company. And it has to do a lot with the vision because the biggest problem that I had in my yeah, in my years as a managing director of my agency is that I had the vision in my head. I, I felt the vision. I lived the vision. But the problem that I had, I was not communicating the vision and I was not checking if my employees understood the vision of your company. So what I do uh, right now and what I do most of the time now is once a week I just go to my employees, go to my colleagues and say, guys, do you remember what was our vision? And it may sound very stupid to you, like why would you repeat the vision? But what is really important is uh, all of us forget about the vision. And if you don't understand the vision of the company, it's very hard to, uh, you know, to do anything because how are you supposed to sell? How are you supposed to uh, deliver results when you don't understand the vision of your company? Again, put it black and white. Everything you discuss, just put it in black and white. I had a huge uh, problem right now uh, for an event that we recently did in, in Montenegro. We had a partner and most of the communication was done uh, verbally. It wasn't done in writing. And from our side, we understood things one way. From their side, uh, it was completely different. And the mistake was com completely ours because we had previous communications with them and we thought, you know, this time it's gonna be the same, but it wasn't. And the issues, the problems happen because we didn't put things in black and white. Always, especially when you agree on terms. And I'm not talking here about contacting your lawyers and drafting a contract. But just really putting things in black and white and summarizing what has been discussed and what are the next steps. Another important thing is not overpromise. Now, what happens when you are leading a team, when you're leading a company? At the beginning, you're overexcited. You really believe in the vision. You really believe in product. You really believe that you will deliver, right? And, and what happens is you start promising people things which 
uh, you want to do, which you want to give, but the reality is a bit different. And I will tell you about a mistake I did at the beginning of my company. When I, when I launched my company six year, years ago, I was so excited about the company, and I thought that in one year we'll become millionaires. And then we'll become millionaires, we'll have a kindergarten, we'll be the next Google. Now what happened? I mean, we, we didn't become millionaires, <laughs> obviously, but what happened is that I promised people certain things. And when I was not able to deliver, and I understand why I wasn't able to deliver. I wasn't able to deliver uh, yeah, I'm changing uh, semi presentations now. I'm on the slide where it says don't over promise. So when you promise something, like the employees really hold to that information. And when you, not you, when you don't deliver, even though if you wanted to deliver, but because of financial situation, because of things that are happening, you're not doing it. The reality is that in the eyes of the employee, of your team member, you're a liar. So what I do right now is obviously we have targets in the company and I surprise people because it's, it's more important to surprise people and give them something extra than to over promise something that is really, really big and then it will not happen. Now, don't rely on common sense. We're, uh, you know, in our heads, some things are common sense. You know, you would expect that everyone would do them. Um, it's the first slide all the time. I'm, I'm switching. I'm actually on uh, another slide. What about the others? Is it switching or not? Okay. Guys, I mean, I, I really want to make this an exciting presentation, but I, it just with the phone and everything, it's really hard to do things. So I don't know, should we maybe postpone? What do you say? I mean, when it comes to me, I'm, I'm fine. It's not an issue, but... <sighs> okay. I did take over as a presenter and I can see the presentation. Uh, from my side, so I think it's the phone version. It's a bit different. Can you see me changing the slide now? Now I am on, be, put it in black and white. Okay. So some people can see it, but some people can't see it. No, because I'm changing slides, so now I'm on the slide, don't overpromise. No. Now, do you see me changing slides? <sighs> okay, let me try to redial, and this will be the last time I try. So, and then if it doesn't work, we'll we'll postpone.
Okay, I'm on my uh, hotspot. So can you see me now? Does it work? Everyone can see me? Okay. Good. It always has to be complicated. Cool. So do you want me to start all over or shall we continue like from where I uh, stopped? Okay. So we covered communicating clearly on all channels. I just have to take my phone. Cool. So we covered and we also covered being consistent in our communication. What is in black and white? It's very important. So everyone is on track. Don't overpromise. I gave you the little story. Now, common sense. This is where we stopped. <coughs> now, all of us have individual common sense in our heads. And what happens and what, ha what is happening to me frequently is I expect people to act or to solve a problem based on common sense. Now, what is a common sense for me may not be common sense for others. So you have to be very clear in your communications because, as I said, not everyone has the same common sense. And sometimes you can really get in trouble and really have a conflict within your organization because you're not clear in your communications. Don't rely on your emotions. And this is very hard, especially in this business world. And I have a friend who always says there is no space place for emotions in this business world. Uh, if you're too emotional, work for an NGO. Don't work for a corporation because really emotions can completely destroy you. And just a really quick story when it comes to the emotions. Uh, a, few, a few years back, uh, we tried to do business in Israel. I love the country, but very hard to do business in. Uh, so we've been successful in 20 countries around the world and we were like finally okay we'll do an event in Israel uh, it was a marketing event actually and now what happens in Israel if you want to do a marketing event the president of the Israeli marketing association has to approve the event uh, so I sent her an email I'll be coming to Israel I would really want to see you uh, and discuss the support of uh, our event because what happens is once you have the support from the Israeli marketing association then they spread the information and pretty much your target group knows all about the event. So we went for the meeting and uh, she was like, wow, the event that you're doing is amazing, really good event. And I, I got so excited. I got so emotional. I'm like, yeah, this is it. Uh, we'll do the event in Israel. It's going to be a major success. And then at the end of the conversation, she said, uh, you know what? We will not support you. And I was like, what do you mean you're not going to support us? Uh, she's like, well, you know, we're the only marketing association in the country. Uh, we've been here for 50 years, and it just feels a bit awkward to support an event that is not produced by us. And I got really, really upset. And it was my ego, actually, because I was like, you know, in my head, who do you think you are now to support the event? And I, uh, be, uh, I reacted very emotionally, and I told her, you know what, we will do the event, and it's going to be the best event, and I'll save you a front row seat so you see what you're going to miss. Well, to make a long story short, we canceled the event two months afterwards. We lost a lot of money, and I went to her and apologized for you know for what I said. But what is really important is you just don't rely on your emotions. Don't rely on being too excited because, you know, good, uh, my friend always says, good times, uh, bad times do not last, but good people do. So just don't rely too much on the emotions when it comes. And... The most important thing, when you get an upsetting email, and all of us have been through this, right? You receive this email, and you feel like, I'm going to sit down now, and I'm going to just write a uh, reply. Don't do it. You know, just wait. Wait for a couple of hours. If you're really upset about something, don't reply on emails when you're upset, because it stays. It's black and white. And, and I'm confident in a couple of hours, your opinion would change. So just... Always give feedback. This is very important, um, and I will cover this later in my presentations because most of the time, again, based on the emotions, you you see a team member struggling, but you don't want to tell them in their face, you know, that they're not doing the job that they're supposed to do. Um, you try to help them, 
but I think the best help is to give people feedback because people need to be aware, especially if you're a team leader, if you have a team, of course, reward your team members if, if they're good. But if they're underperforming, if they're not delivering, you need to give feedback because without giving feedback, no, how are people supposed to improve? For me, it was very hard to give a negative feedback. But negative feedback is actually the feedback that helps you the most because that's when you actually learn and you can change. But if you're not, if you cannot do it, and it's very hard to do it, it, it's very hard to sit down with someone and tell them, listen, you know, what you're doing is not up to our standards. But if you have constant feedback, then people will be aware of the things that they're good in and the things that they actually need to improve. Address problem quickly. Again, this is very much continued um, connected to the feedback. You know, if you have a problem with someone, and especially if you work with teams, if you have a problem with someone, you know, try to address it from day one. Because most of the time, if you have a small problem, it grows, it grows, it grows, and then it explodes for a very small thing. So if you have a problem with, with, a, with a friend, with a colleague, with a team member, address the problem. Tell them your view and try to solve it because you really don't want to destroy a project or a relationship just because of a small thing. And most of the time, it's a very small thing. And what I've learned, and maybe you will not agree with this, most of the time we have conflict with people who actually have similar traits to ours. And this is very hard to believe, but most of the time, the people you have the biggest conflict with is the, are the people that actually behave the same as we do and that's why we actually feel endangered so we you know the only way we can do this is obviously to solve the conflict uh, then fake it till you make it and this is very important when it comes to if you're especially launching your business but what what is very important is that there is a thin line between fake it with, uh, uh, between fake it till you make it and lying uh, now a lot of people you know we live in an era of entrepreneurship people it's sexy to be entrepreneur. That's how the media uh, presents it. But what is really important is that you know your limits. When I say fake it till you make it, it's obvious. When you go for a big meeting, let's say with some big shot, don't let them feel that you are scared. Don't let them feel that you're not on their level. Because what I've noticed from working with all of these uh, big corporations and with the senior directors is they keep working with us and this is actually their, their feedback. They say that we keep working with you because we feel friendly atmosphere. And they feel friendly atmosphere because we've, we've never, I've never, um, through my behavior, felt that I'm beneath them or that they're above me. So this is very important because what happens with these really high powered people if they feel that you are afraid, if they feel that you're not on the same level as you, they will not engage into a conversation with you. And this is um, sad reality. And again, very much connected to what we discussed uh, last time is when you make a mistake, just say, I'm sorry. Uh, because, you know, there is no point in holding a grudge. And especially if you're a team leader and in our culture, in our culture, uh, when it comes to, to leadership, not a lot of people say that they are sorry and this is very important. Cool, now, this are, these were just some of the lessons learned from my experience, but what I wanna do now is discuss some uh, presentation skills and then we'll go into you know uh, communications uh, with bad employees, communications with other poor employees, firing people and those kind of stuff. Now, when it comes to presentation, and obviously because we do events, we do events in, in 30 countries around the world and the, our events have speakers. So throughout the years, I've discovered what actually really works when it comes to presentations. The most important is the preparation time. You really have to research your audience. Who are you speaking to? Who are you addressing? Like what is really annoying, for example, like we have, and I mentioned this to all of my American speakers when they speak in Azerbaijan or, you know, Georgia, countries that, you know, they're very, uh, people are educated, they're following trends, but in the perception of the Western world, they feel that these countries are backwards. And they would ask a question to the audience like, oh, guys, do you know who is Oprah? And I'm like, of, of course they knew who is Oprah. Like everyone knows who, who Oprah is. But you know they feel just just because they're that this 
people are not part of the American culture, they wouldn't know. So it's very important to research the audience. Then structure your presentation. And the best way to structure your presentation is there are three parts. Obviously, you have the opening. And at the opening, you actually have to establish that emotional connection with the audience. You know, it can be a, you can share a story, you can ask a question, or, you know, show uh, some statistics, but something that will make an impact. You know, the opening slide is like, wow, you get people are getting excited and, you know, they will continue following. So you have the opening, now it's time for the body. Now, when it comes to body, it's very important when you prepare the presentation to create three, five, six, how many points you want and just stick to those points. And then, of course, we have the closing. And the closing is when you give the audience something that will stick with them. You can go back to the opening, but something, you know, that will, in a way, summarize everything. So you research your audience, you've created the structure, you have the opening, you have the body, you have the closing. And the most important thing is practice, 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 practice. But what I've noticed is that some people, they memorize, they don't practice, they memorize. And what happens? They sound very robotic, number one. And number two, if there is a question in the middle of the presentation, they cannot go back afterwards to presenting because, you know, they have, when they practice, they memorize it, they memorize the flow, they memorize what they're going to say. So when someone interrupts them, it pretty much destroys the image that they've created in their head. And it's very hard for them to, to, to go back to presenting. So don't memorize. Actually, what I do with my presentations, they're very visual. You guys noticed in the previous presentations that I use a lot of images. This time it's a bit different because we will talk about, you know, some terms that I want that, and some steps that we need to follow. So there's going to be more text. But really, just work on those visuals. And the why I use visuals is not because I, I want the presentation to be pretty. Yeah, the presentation will be pretty. But the visuals are a reminder to the story that I want to tell. Because when you don't memorize, when you know the concept of the presentation, you need something, you know, that one thing, you know, that will keep you on track. So you also don't, uh, you know, start talking about things that are not uh, actually in the presentation. Now, you've practiced and it's time to present. What is really important is for you to be brief. You don't want to have a slide and talk about that slide for 20 minutes. Why? Because our attention span as people is eight seconds, which is one second less than the goldfish. So you, so don't expect you have, you know, you spend 10 minutes talking on one slide. Don't expect that people will follow you. It's just not going to happen. So be brief. Go straight to the point. Ask questions to keep the audience engaged. This is very important because uh, you know, it, it's also a pause for you. It's also a pause for you to relax, but also the audience will appreciate it because they feel that you're interested in what they ha what they have to say. Again, speak to your demographic, uh, and when I when I say speak to your demographic, is very much connected to researching the audience that you will present and backing people. For example, if you put a, a finance person in a marketing conference, you can immediately notice that they're from a finance institution because they have that, you know, banking kind of behavior a little bit, you know, a little bit uh, something that the marketing people cannot connect to. And this makes it sometimes really hard because uh, speakers can have great content, but they don't speak to their demographic. You know, marketing people are creative. They want visuals, and then you have a finance guy, you know, with uh, percentages, with boxes, with with this kind of stuff, and they just cannot connect because they're actually not speaking to their demographic. Working on your tone, obviously, uh, you know, don't try to have a pitchy voice. Try to have a stronger voice, uh, and this way your statements will have a much bigger impact. Again, avoid speaking softly. One thing that I try to avoid, and it happens all the time, for me there are two things, push, mm, mm, and like. I don't know, but when, when I was studying English in this, like was like the most commonly used word. So what I try to do is eliminate that word like. Are you guys using that word in your communication? It's the worst thing. 
It's the worst thing that can happen, especially if it's a formal presentation. Try to avoid mm, and then, uh, you know, like. And don't use words like don't. Your thing as a presenter is to give solutions. So don't say don't do this, don't do that. And actually, this is what I actually wanted to cover. Are you guys with me? I don't see any interaction. Can you follow me? Can you hear me? Like yes. Okay, good. Good. Don't use words like don't. Now what this is very much connected to also to your assignments for the Blackberry. Uh, and this is a very positive comment for everyone and a lesson. When you are asked to provide solutions, you need to provide solutions. You don't say, uh, Blackberry didn't have this, Blackberry didn't have that, or you should, you shouldn't do this, don't do this. No. You should actually provide a solution. Because what happens if I tell you, don't think about an elephant? All of you thought of an elephant, right? That word don't is just, you know, it is destroys everything. And as a presenter, you need to provide the solutions. You want to tell people this is what you need to do, not you shouldn't do this. Cool. And, of course, PowerPoint, even though a lot of events, a lot of companies are trying, in a way, to get rid of PowerPoints. You will see a lot of, a lot of events saying death to the PowerPoint, death to the PowerPoint. I still think that a nicely designed PowerPoint with nice images, it just gives nice visual representation of your presentation. But some of the points for a good PowerPoint, number one, as I said, use nice images. You should have one or two sentences per slide. It should be entertaining. So try to have some fun images, you know, some content that people will connect to. And in a way, they are your guide to the presentation. They are not your presentation. So the images are guiding. You're the storyteller. You show, you tell the story through the images. But don't expect the images to, you know, word by word to, to the images to have word by word the things that you want to actually present. Uh, bad PowerPoint, so you shouldn't use font smaller than 32. And I, I just hate when people, you know, they load this PowerPoint slides and there is so much text, you cannot read anything. So you should have maximum five or six lines per text. You shouldn't have a logo on all, on, on all sides. And actually this program, they asked me to put logo on each slide. Uh, and actually I don't see the point of putting a logo. It's not like people will forget who you are. And then the worst thing is you don't, and a lot of, uh, a lot of events do this or a lot of speakers do this. They, they print their, info, uh, PDF, uh, their PowerPoint and they hand it out to the audience. And this pretty much is like going to the movies for a movie premiere and someone gives you the script and you read it and you understand what has happened. The whole point of the PowerPoint is to show your story. If it's all printed, people will actually know what you're going to present them. So there will be no engagement. They will already uh, know the things that you will cover. Do we have any questions up to here? Is this helpful? Only Sammy is typing. Cool. Now let's continue if you guys don't have any questions. Now, I don't want to be negative now through my point of the presentations, but one thing that no one explains to us in school or in studies is really how to deliver bad news. And this is actually the hardest thing about communication. It's very easy to go tell someone you've done an amazing job, you're good, you're the best, you're great. But what happens when you actually have to sit down and deliver news that the people are not expecting, news that people don't like, and news that if you are a manager in a company can eventually get that employee fired. Now, especially in business, as a manager, you walk a fine line between being a company advocate an employee advocate. And this is such a powerful sentence because also for me as a business owner, um, Sammy, this PowerPoint, I can use another presentation problem. Okay, uh, you can email me about this and then we'll, we will discuss it. 
but this sentence and all of you will get caught in this kind of situation especially if you're managing a team or a project or whatever you have to make your employees happy but you also have to make the companies happy and you cannot actually have rarely you will have both of them happy and as a manager as a leader you have to keep that balance so how do you deliver this kind of news and this will actually help you also in your homework which is about delivering uh, bad news about layoffs preparation time is here is key when you go to your employees to your team team members friends colleagues or whatever these are things that you can use in daily life is you have to explain how the decision was made why was the decision made who was consulted who did we speak to about the decision you have to explain that other possibilities were discussed that this wasn't actually what we wanted to do in the beginning we were trying to see other options and then finally what was what is the rational behind the final outcome why did we decide to do this and this is very important you cannot go and deliver a bad news and you cannot go and tell that you're gonna fire 20 percent of your company unless you have all of this information how the decision was made who was consulted what other possibilities were discussed and the rationale behind the final outcome you need to have all of these things ready before you actually go to the meeting and brief the people next and this is what most of us do most of the time is we give mixed messages now what is really important especially when delivering bad news is to watch our body language if we are shaking if our hands are sweating people will notice that we are not comfortable with the information that we are about to present we should not leave no room for interpretation we don't want people to say yeah he said that but I could see that he's scared or he said that but I'm not sure that he meant it this kind of situation you shouldn't leave any room for interpretation so that's why it's very important to rehearse what you're going to say and finally and the most important thing is show that you're thoughtful show that you're caring but don't sugarcoat the news you know you cannot say oh we are firing 20 percent of the people but the other 80 percent will have uh you know because we're firing 20 percent the other 80 percent will have a much better working experience it doesn't work like that don't sugarcoat the news be thoughtful be caring but don't present a pink situation now when it comes to the explaining how the decision was made you know there has to be a procedural fairness people have to understand why the thing that's happened has happened so you can say here is the process that was followed the people we spoke with and where things came out and what is really important is and we all of us do this mistake and this is the greatest the hardest thing when you're actually a team leader or your manager is not sharing your point of view now you may not agree with the decision was made that was made you may not agree of course you will not agree with 20 percent of your colleagues being fired but if you're a management you have to play the balance between what the board wants the corporations and the employees so don't share your viewpoint this has a lot to do with diplomacy you know show that you care show that you understand but don't say ah you know I agree no because at the end of the day what you have to understand especially when you're a team leader or at work if you're a manager you're a manager to those employees you're not the friend of their employees don't say it is difficult and a lot of people when they start delivering bad news they say oh, this is very difficult for me to uh, to deliver don't do that because if you say that is it is difficult they people will know that there's going to be a drama uh, there's going to be a negative hype so you're starting the conversation on a very bad note and the more negative hype you generate in your mind the more nervous you'll be and the longer you'll put it off so just don't call it difficult it's just something that you have to do don't use a script that's why actually the exercise that we will do is obviously you will have the script ready 
when we are presenting, you're not supposed to read the script. Script and this isn't a play, so don't try to write a script. You the word should come from your heart, and that's why rehearsal, rehearsal is very important. Now, you will deliver the bad news. You will explain the rationale why it happened. Uh, you will explain who consulted, and what is really important is that you allow people to vent. Ask what they think about it. Ask what their reaction is. But what is really important is this is venting, it's not a debate. A debate means that the solution or the information that was presented is not final. When you're actually going to present this kind of information, it's a final solution, it's the final decision. So you cannot allow debate. Yes, allow them to express their views, allow them to say uh, how they feel, but do not create an atmosphere for a debate when people can say, oh, but you should have done this, you cannot do this, and things like that. And again, this is very much connected to the preparation time, how the decision was made. <coughs> and again, if you're a manager, resist the impulse to align with the team. And this is very hard, because if you're a team manager, of course you're going to be with your team, right? But if half of the team is fired and the other half is not happy about it, you cannot go to the five that are not happy about it and just align with them and say, yeah, I agree, we shouldn't fire the five, uh, the, the five employees that we fired. No, because, and you know, again, this is a lot has to do with the emotions. But in business, there are no emotions. You have to understand the art of diplomacy. And you have to understand what the corporation wants, what the employee wants. And it's not just in business. Every organization, there is the needs of the organizations. There are the needs of individuals. And sometimes they're aligned. Sometimes they're completely different. But you have to, as a manager, it's very hard to make that balance, whether you're the corporation or whether you're with the team. So when it comes to aligning with the team, and I like this quote, he says, the one thing you don't want to do is get into a debate about the merits of a decision that has already been made. You know, you should do a debate before the decision was actually made. This is the time when you actually debate. But once the decision was made, there is no space for a debate. And what is really important is that really you need to focus on the future. So you've delivered the bad information. You've explained the decision behind it. Uh, you've allowed your employees to vent, but now focus on the future. Give people a couple of days and then focus on the things you will do in the future. And what happens and what you really need to do is indicate that you're a partner in whatever happens next. You have to explain, yes, this has happened. Unfortunately, we have to do this kind of things, but I'm here for you in the future. So these kind of things do not happen again and we'll deliver the results. This is very nice closing. You know, we've done all of the bad things, the bad things, but now let's focus on the future. What can we do together as a team? Just a small summary. When you deliver bad news, things you have to do. Understand why the decision was made before sharing your news. Prepare and rehearse what you're going to say and explain the rationale and the process for making the decision. You have to do this. Whenever team, colleagues, employees, oh, my presentation disappeared. Oh, just the moment I thought that there is no drama. Costa, you realize that we are still on the slide number 10 here. You guys are not following me at all, huh? Why didn't anyone comment? Ah, you have? Okay, okay. Um, but now my PowerPoint disappeared. Let me load it again. And I'm talking about communication, and this is the most stressful webinar that we've had in the past three weeks. Um, Alexander, can you upload my file? It disappeared. Okay. 
Okay, everyone is following me manually. My computer doesn't work. My PowerPoint. At least we are communicating. You know, we can still communicate through the messages. Okay. Uh, I had to re-upload my presentation, so uh, I have to go back uh, to the slide. Okay. Sorry, guys, about this. You know, this was actually was supposed to be the cherry on the pie, the presentation that summarizes everything and. Uh, okay, so focusing on the future. So do we we went through the do's and now the don'ts. Again, don't sugarcoat the news. Be clear and direct. Body language. Don't shake. Don't feel uncomfortable. Allow and don't allow people to debate the merits of decision. So it's all about focusing on the future. Focusing on the future. Now. Another thing that is very important is be compassionate but not emotional. Because you don't want to be the victim in the situation, right? Whatever you do, do not portray emotions or play the victim during these kind of conversations. And this is the hardest thing, especially if you're an emotional person. God, I mean, you will suffer. But eventually, you'll, have, you'll learn and you'll do it. Now, we will not go through this. This is your... Um, homework actually. Now I want to talk about a bit about communications and workplace conflicts and um, we spend like eight to ten hours a day at work and of course it cannot all be pinky and friendly. Obviously we're gonna have uh, issues uh, with our colleagues, with our management, so I just wanted to talk about how to avoid these kind of co conflicts by communicating clearly. Uh, one thing that I learned is when a conflict arises among team members, among colleagues, action should be taken very quickly. Again, I said this in the beginning, don't wait for things to pile up. Address it as soon as possible. You have a new team member, you see that they're not delivering, address it, ask them. What are the reasons for the project not being delivered? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe they have some personal problems that you don't know about. That's why we need to address these kind of issues. Because by addressing them immediately, we give ourselves time to solve them faster. If you wait a really long time, sometimes issues can be unsolvable. Now, setting clear expectations. If you're a team member, if you're a leader, you know, both in terms of what you expect from your team, and what they expect of you, set these expectations. Guys, as your manager, what do you expect from me? Hear that input. And then you you explain what you expect from your team. So everyone has the same expectations. Because most of the time, conflicts happen because we have different expectations about things. So that's why from start, this is what I expect from you. What do you expect from me? Listen. Listen to your team. Listen to what they have to say. And then recognize and respect personal differences. Not everyone in the workplace can or is the same. Of course, there are people with, with different attitudes. People have different opinions. And you have to recognize and respect this. Not everyone at work is going to be like you. As a team leader and as a manager, I think uh, some other things that you have to be aware of um, is uh, and obviously to avoid this kind of conflict is number one define acceptable behavior uh, don't think that people will assume what is acceptable or what is not what happened with us I assume that people would know how certain processes are done within my company but that's what I thought the reality was different so what I did I created this manual about our company where it explains all the things, you know, all the processes. So we don't have to spend time to ask, oh, where is this folder? Where is this document? And things like that. Define acceptable behavior. Define everything within your team. And define what is acceptable. You know, some companies allow working from home. I don't. You know, I have creative people coming and saying, you know, I'm really innovative. I really want to work for your company. But I'm a kind of person that works from home. You know, that's great for you, but as a company, I need someone to be in the office and work with us as a team. That kind of working from home is not acceptable. But this is very important that you define it uh, from day one. Uh, 
uh, again hit conflicts head on um, try to prevent it from growing and then this is very important understanding the Y I I F M factor do you guys will know what this is W I I F M do you know what this stands for what's in it for me because a lot of team members you know behave like that all of us behave like that what's in it for me so as a as a team leader as a manager the, a good way to avoid conflict is to help those around you achieve their objectives so ask your colleagues ask your employees what is it that you want to do what is it that you want to achieve and help them achieve that because all of us have you know certain things that we need that we want try to understand what works for each team member and then work together with them to make it happen now what is really important and and I think most of you will agree with this is the importance factor and actually is about to pick the battles that you will fight because you know some people just enter conflicts they, they just well, for whatever it is, they start fighting. But my thing is, you have to pick um, the battles that you will. I got a puppy, so he came here now. Uh, so you have to pick the battles that you will that you will fight, because obviously you cannot uh, get involved in any conflict. And at the end, and this is very cliche, but this is very impo important is you have to view conflict as an opportunity especially with people that you don't like or people that in the beginning you had a negative opinion about you know if you address that conflict if you tell them you know this is what I didn't like this is what I would like to change you will see that that can turn into the most productive relationship and the most productive partnership within the company cool so are we clear with this Now, cool. Uh, now, most of, I mean, all of us are not native speakers, so I just wanted to share with you some uh, uh, phrases that you can use when you're delivering bad news, um, and they're quite simple. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. I'm sorry to have to tell you that. I regret to inform you that. I'm afraid to inform you. It is my unfortunate duty to tell you. I'm afraid I won't be able to. You know, these are just some phrases that you can use when you send emails. Um, when you tr try to, uh, you know, when, when you actually have to deliver the bad news. Now, when it comes to the explaining why, again, we discussed about the rationale. These are some of the phrases that you can use. Unfortunately, there are some problems with. After consulting with my colleagues, if you look at the attached information, you'll see that just some phrases that you can use to, you know, for the explaining part of the process. And then, again, you have to op offer sympathy, but you shouldn't be too emotional. So I like these phrases. Please accept my apologies for, you know, for any inconvenience this is, this has caused. Please accept my apologies. I know this isn't what you wanted to hear. Please accept my apologies. I do wish that the situation were different. I apologize for an inconvenience caused. I can appreciate your feelings on this. I know it isn't what you hoped for, and I can appreciate why you feel that way. So you see your. I like this, I can appreciate why you feel that way. It means that you're connecting with the emotion of the person, but at the same time you're not expressing, you're not being too emotional. So you have the PowerPoints, you have this kind of, these things that you can actually go through and, you know, you can use them. Now, uh, I just want to share with you an example and uh, I would like to apologize in advance if you have someone that has had cancer or someone that has been through cancer uh, and obviously when it comes to delivering bad news there is no worse news to be delivered than the news to have cancer and a lot of doctors have developed what is called spikes a six-step protocol for delivering bad news and this is a protocol that uh, healthcare facilities and doctors use when they communicate with, pa with patients that have cancer it summarizes all the elements that one has to have when it comes to delivering bad news now there are six parts so the first part is obviously setting up the interview so and 
this is general for each kind of conversation. You know, if you're having a conversation with someone about their um, performance, about their work, you know, do it somewhere private. Arrange for some privacy. Uh, when it comes to delivering information about cancer, doctors say that you know, the patient should always involve significant, significant others. But in management, in life, when you have a hard conversation with someone, you should always involve someone else. You should also invite someone else to the conversation. Why is it important to invite a, second, a third person in this kind of situation? I'm not talking about cancer, but general, if you have a conflict with someone or if you're firing someone, why is it important to have a third person in the meeting room? You can type your answers. Yeah. But what else? What act mostly in America, what it happens? And America is very well known about this. Witness. You have to have a witness because you don't know how someone will react to the bad news. And especially in America where people can sue everyone about everything, it's very important to have the third person. In this case, doctors involve a significant other or a, a relative or a member uh, or a friend is as a support. In management, we also have that person as a support, but he's more as a witness, someone that will confirm what has been said. You have to sit down. You cannot have a, a serious uh, a meeting or to deliver bad news by standing. You have to sit down and you have to look the person into the eyes, make connection with the person. And one thing that irritates me a lot is when people, when you have a serious conversation about the performance or someone is talking to you about a project and they cannot even look in your eyes. This is the number one thing in all communication is when you talk to someone, look at people in their eyes. So step one, setting up the interview. Now, step two in this, uh, this, uh, in this process is assessing the patient's perception. What does it mean? Before you tell, you ask. So before they discuss the results, uh, the doctors start asking open-ended uh, questions. So they can, and why do they do this? They do this so they can get an accurate uh, picture of how the patient perceives the medical situation. In, in a case of dealing with an employee, you know, start asking open-minded questions, open-ended uh, questions to see, to understand whether your team member really knows what this meeting is about. You know, you're setting the tone. So by getting the knowledge of what they really know, whether they know what this meeting is about, you know, you can set up the strategy and deliver the news accordingly. Now, step three is obtaining the patient's invitation. And this is when you set the tone for the rest of the communication. And what usually doctors do in these kind of situations is they ask the patient, how would you like me to give the information about the test results? Would you like me to give you all the information or sketch out the results and spend more time discussing the treatment plan? You know, you just want to see how far you can go with the information. This is very important. And this is very also important in, um, you know, checking whether the person is psychologically ready to hear that information. Obviously, it's different in management, um, but obtaining the patient's invitation, it means that you have done the preparation, uh, you know, you have established the eye contact, um, you have assessed the perceptions, and now you're actually going deeper into the conversation and delivering the news. And step three is actually the hardest steps of all of this. Step four is giving knowledge and information to the to the patient. So what doctors do is they start at the level of, of uh, comprehension and the vocabulary of the patient. And this also has to do a lot when you, when technical people deal with non-technical people. You know, try to tone it down. Try to uh, uh, dissect the information. Uh, doctors cannot go to, to patients with this 
you know, medical terms and explain to them in medical terms, oh, you have this, this and that. No, they have to say it in plain words. They have to use non-technical words. This is very important in communication when you're, when you, especially when you're, man uh, when you're talking to your team, you don't want to talk in terms that no one understands. And you have to give information in small chunks. Uh, doctors cannot just go to the patient and deliver the information and say, you know what, you have cancer uh, and you have stage four cancer. No, you have to give information in small chunks. And giving information in small chunks in business world, in management world, is very much connected to, you know, when you want to fire someone in the business world, you don't just wake up one day and fire them. No. There has been a process built up of warnings of discussions, and this is actually firing is the the, the last thing. Uh, and the last thing in step four is when the prognosis is poor, uh, doctors do not use phrases such as there is nothing more that we can do for you, uh, which obviously they want to they wanna leave on a positive note because you also want to keep, keep the patient, uh, give the patient a window that, you know, with, with therapy that can, things can actually improve. Now, another very hard part is, is addressing the patient's emotions and especially not just patients but also in the business world what happens when you have a when you deliver bad news to someone or you're about to fire someone there's going to be a lot of emotions from their side so you have to learn how to to show emotions to show to show empathy but not to be uh, emotional and also you have to connect with that emotion so in in, in medical terms Doctors have to observe for any emotion on the part of the patient. So if they're starting to crying, if they're feeling sad, silent, or shocked, you know, you have to you have to identify what kind of emotion the person is projecting so you can actually define your reaction. Uh, you know, ask them what what is uh, the reason for, for the emotion. If if you're having a bad conversation with with an employee, you know, what is the reason for your tears, what is your reason for your shock, because we've discussed all of this. And you will notice there are some people that when you have these kind of meetings, they instantly cry. And this is a very hard situation to deal with. What is really important also in step five is to give the patient a brief, brief period of time to express his or his feelings. Also in meetings, you know, you cannot just tell someone, oh, you know what, you're fired. You have to give them space to express their feelings, to express how they feel. And then, uh, so this is just an example. Uh, you know, the doctor says, I'm sorry to say that the x-ray shows that the chemotherapy doesn't seem to be working. So the patient says, I'm afraid of this. And the doctor, of course, moves the chairs closer and so says, I know that this isn't what you wanted to hear. I wish the news were better. So he understands the emotions of the, of the patient. And he is trying to, be, to show empathy, but at the same time, show that he is in control and not show too much emotions when delivering. And then in all communications, you know, the last part is before we talked about focusing on the future, in medical terms, step six is strategy and the summary. So you discuss the things that has been dis discovered and you define the strategy of where are we going next um, with, the, with the process. And this is very important in everything. So. <clears throat> If you're having a meeting with your with a team member that is not delivering the information, uh, step six should always be okay. This is what we discussed, and I think this is and, and this is what is going to be our strategy for the future. You have to finish each kind of conversation with focus on the strategies. Now, another thing that I wanted to discuss is managing underperforming employees or team members. So how do you communicate with them? How do you deal with this? Uh, we're running a bit over time, so I'll make this quick. Um, there are several things that you actually need to do uh, in order to transform that relationship you know, from underperforming to uh, a performing employee. Uh, number one is that you have to give that person as much feed feedback as possible. And this is very much connected to what I discussed in the beginning is uh, if there is a problem, you address that problem immediately. You don't wait for the problem to escalate. You have to also unnerd the cause of the problem. 
because a lot of people underperform not because they don't like the job is because they have some kind of personal problem so talk with them see why they're behaving like that see why they're not performing you know maybe they have health issues maybe they have family issues maybe they have problems but how do you uh, you know ask them and, and find out what is the reason for their uh, be, uh, behavior uh, another thing is you know have to find out what makes an employee tick so what are their long-term goals and aspirations and where would they like to see their career headed where do they see themselves um, because maybe one of the reasons because they're underperforming is because you're as a company as an organization you're not giving them what they actually need uh, what they actually want uh, another thing which I feel is very important and a lot of us make a mistake is that we create this kind of targets and we don't consult our employees or our team members about these targets we just put the targets and of course the, the team uh, is going to feel they're underperforming because they know that the targets are not realistic so that's why it's very important to include employees in the process of outlining performance target, uh, targets and a great leader not just a good leader but a great leader always follow ups with the employees you know you have the strategy meeting you discuss what you've discussed you discuss the strategy follow up what are we doing on this how are we doing with this how close we are to solving this and things like that and you have to uh, also reward employees if you've had a meeting with them and you've seen an improvement you have to reward them you cannot just uh, have meetings about you know their underperformance when they've done something good you also have to uh, reward them and then if you know after all these kind of meetings and you've tried all of these kind of th uh, these things uh, if an employee continues to underperform you know you need to formally address this behavior verbally then written and then at the end unfortunately uh, we need to cut the ties and uh, fire that person now and this is the last slide is letting go of employees and I was fired from my first job uh, I felt really hard uh, really bad I've also fired people in my in my uh, company and it's the hardest thing that one will do and but you will eventually do it all of us will do it uh, and what I've realized is for me it was hard to do it because number one I was too emotional number two is uh, I was firing people without actually giving them the proper feedback before I actually had everything in my head I actually didn't explain to them uh, you know what I expected for them I knew that they were not performing but I didn't help them understand the things that they need to improve uh, so it will happen to all of us and just really quick couple of advice um, you should never find an employee using uh, emails voice email or phone calls it should be you know in private you should invite them uh, and have a face-to-face -face conversation about this you, you cannot fire an employee without warning so that's why you know go slides where we uh, talked about underperforming employees these are uh, this is the period when you actually have to define the strategy and if you see that they're not delivering on the on the strategy uh, then you should warn, start warning them about uh, you know the fact that they're not improving and then eventually if they're not improving at all uh, obviously you need to do a written warning and fire them uh, again we've discussed this don't fire an employee without a witness you need to have someone that will back up the things that you said uh, you have to be short for example you say we've already discussed your performance issue we are terminating your employment because your performance does not meet the standards we expect for this position so it's very short you don't go into a drama you don't turn it into a soap opera you go straight to the point and don't let the employee believe the decision is not final uh, you know one thing if you've decided to fire someone don't change your mind it has happened to me I would go for a meeting thinking that I would fire someone and they've been briefed they've they've been told that they're under and I would call them for a meeting and I would think the meeting is for not fire if it's for firing them and then I would have conversation with them I would be really emotional I would understand their pain and I would give them another chance and then eventually they would leave the company so when you make a decision make sure that the decision is final 
Uh, now, some of the things that are not so enjoyable is don't allow the employee to live with company property in his possession. Uh, the hardest uh, firing that I've experienced is in 2008. I think that I uh, spoke to you about this. Um, when the financial crisis started in, in Dubai, every morning I was buying Starbucks for my team. And one morning I went and asked my team, what do you guys want from Starbucks? So I made the order, went to Starbucks, and when I came back, there was no team. Everyone was fired. Uh, and the way they were fired, I, I thought that it's very cruel, but now as time goes, I understand why this happens. Uh, number one, you know, once people get fired, they should not live with company property in possessions. Uh, and then don't allow the former employee to access his work area or co-workers. Uh, why do you think this is important? Why do you, when, when companies fire someone, they tell them you're fired and pretty much they escort them outside of the building. They don't allow contact with colleagues. Why do you think this is important? Influence. Okay. Anyone else? It will, if it will definitely uh, demotivate others, right? You don't want to see your colleague being fired. Revenge, of course, yeah. You know, uh, there have been employees that go back to their uh, office and start screaming. They start making drama and things like that. So that's why a lot of companies, and I agree with them, is, you know, once you fire someone, uh, you should not allow them to go back to their working area. And what is really important is if you've made that final decision, is you have to change the passwords of the emails, you have to block access to accounts to the employee while you're having that meeting. I've had people that have left my company with our database because I, you know, I was like, why do they need the database? But they, they would still the, the database. Um, <clears throat> and leave the company, you know, go work for another company with our database. But now I understand that, you know, once someone is not performing and you want to fire them, the moment when you're having this conversation is when you change the password. <laughs> this is all about security. And then the most important, this is what is happening in 99% of the situations with me, is don't end the meeting on a low note. Um, try to focus on the future. Most of the time you will see that you know, the people that you fired or people that you have let go, eventually they will find a job that, uh, you know, that they enjoy, a job that they love, and they would actually be happy that, uh, you know, you decided to let them go. And I know this is very hard to uh, digest, but really, once they find that dream job, they will understand why they were not the right fit for your company. Uh, so... For the assignment, uh, sorry guys, I will admit I wasn't 100% today uh, because first, you know, the internet, everything, and the last thing is I have this monster that is bothering me the whole time. Uh, but I'm here for uh, any feedback that you need. Uh, and if you have any additional uh, information, what, what's the name of my dog? Kire. It's a Macedonian name, Kire. Kirill. It's actually his name day tomorrow. Yeah, we're celebrating his name day tomorrow. So for the assignment, we're going to do simulation and role play. Uh, so there are two parts. The first part, the deadline is May 23rd, 25th. You're the CEO of a large multinational company. You're about to lay off 30% of your workforce and your head of communication has arranged for you a press conference you, when, where you will announce the layoffs. So you have to pre prepare the speech, 500 words, and you have to record yourself. And the recording can be up to five minutes, and you don't have to worry, oh, my recording is three minutes or three and a half minutes. As long as it's a good speech, as long as it's a good delivery, that's what matters. Uh, so that's step one. And now for step two is in Teams, you will go over each other videos and you will grade them from one to five 
one being the lowest score, five being the highest score. So this is pretty much all for me for now. Uh, I hope that I try to convey to you uh, the importance of negative situations. And I didn't want to sound negative. I just wanted to prepare to prepare you for situations that are unavoidable. No matter how good managers we are, no matter how great leaders we are, you know, there will be moments that we need to fire someone, that we need to deliver bad news. Uh, and these are actually the moments that will define us as, as leaders. And these are the moments that people will remember us for. So you, you always have to know the black stuff, but also you have to know the white stuff. Uh, so this is the last web webinar for me of the course. Next week is ISEGUL. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for your support and your for your interaction. I also want to note that if you guys have any comments about my grades for your homework, please feel free to write to me and please feel free to consult with me. Because, again, uh, if you feel that you haven't done uh, them the way you should be, if you, want, if you feel that you want to change them, if you're not happy with the grade, you know, just approach me and I'll make sure that we discuss it. And then this week I'll go through your crisis communications exercise. And then I'll see you in July in Struga. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for the interaction. And we're signing out. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Okay. Uh, in step one of assignment, is it a speech for media or it's a speech for the employees? So you have to go in front of the employees and announce that 30% of them will be fired. Cool? See you guys. All the best. Bye.